today. Uh, you will know, of course, that um, Barbara Wesson, who was the keynote for this slot, unfortunately is suffering pneumonia and therefore has not been able to come over from Sweden, which is a real shame. So the program um, core team had a discussion about, OK, um, we need to put on something that is just as good, if not better, than uh, Barbara Wasson, which is a tall task. But I think we may well be able to do it because we have a distinguished list of academics, uh, uh, um, experts, officials lined up um, before you who are... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I, th I think this is probably one of these sessions that is, is very much about the making sense bit of the sea change. Because I think we're hearing a lot of the kind of developments that are happening. There's lots of the research that's going on. Um, the, obviously, the kind of development of systems, thinking about the broader context of um, social technologies and so forth. All sorts of discussions around that and the infrastructures and so forth. But I think the key thing is, is making sense of it. And I think... Um, having a debate and a discussion and a dialogue around, okay, what's really important here? And I think that will help us all to, try to understand what we might need to focus on, perhaps in our pro professional lives, in implementing, um, designing new technologies, researching, working, or, or um, establishing policy around, around them. Um, so that's what we're going to do um, with some, as I say, distinguished input. Uh, they, they are, I'm, I'm going to chair quite, quite tightly here, we will have six five-minute inputs from um, each of the um, contributors to the panel who are, I'll introduce, but I'll also ask them when they get up to talk about what they are, what, where they come from, what their job is, um, around this topic. Um, if you had to concentrate on one single activity that would foster a sea change, what would it be and why? So this is really about what's what's making sense of what's going on here, what's significant and what's important in taking this work forward and this agenda forward. So without further ado, I'll invite Jilly Salmon up. Well, colleagues, thank you for this unexpected opportunity <laughs> to talk to you. Um, okay, I'm Professor of E-Learning and Learning Technology at the University of Leicester, where I head up the Beyond Distance Research Alliance. And from January, I'll be Professor of Learning Futures at the University of Southern Queensland. Now, I've used that opportunity to tell you because that's uh, my single activity um, for the forthcoming years will be to try and, with all your help, create the future. And I'm going to have one more go at the sea change metaphor to try and explain to you what I mean by that. Um, if you could imagine a beautiful beach, it's probably in Queensland, but it could be somewhere <laughs> else. <laughs> um, and there's big breakers coming in and breaking on the beach, and you're standing there, and you're watching, if you like, the pebbles on the beach, and you're watching the sand, um, and you're probably watching them in driftwood or anything else that's around. Now, as you watch a breaker coming in, some of it would ripple across the beach and just disappear and, and sink in. Um, others would move a pebble a bit further. Um, others might crush in up and, you know, in certain um, environmental conditions, might sort of crash into cars driving along the promenade, for example, and lots of other metaphors that you can think of. And I think we're in this kind of position now and I don't think we should just be standing by watching this happen. I think we need to start getting our buckets and spades out and start to dig some of the channels to start to help some of these waves go in some of the directions we want. And I'm going to offer you a very simple model um, for doing this. You know I like models. Um, one is that we have hindsight now of a thousand years of formal education and a lot more of informal education. We didn't invent informal education, did we? It's been going on for many years. Um, but even if you take the thousand years of higher education, for example, there's enormous hindsight from that. But what we need to do now is gather that up and make sure we've got the insight that will take us forward. So for me, 
Um, it is the ecological relationship um, between all the various strands of what we're doing would be the key insight from looking back into history. And that's where the foresight comes in. We need to use all of that to start digging those channels to create the future rather than stand by and let it happen. And if learning technologists, the learning technology community with all the associates can't do it, then who can? It really does have to be us digging those channels, I think. Um, and I, so I think for my foresight is this just a position, the systems approach, the ecological approach to actually putting everything together and enabling the waves to channel in our preferred directions rather than standing by and shaking our fists at the, the one wave that knocked us over. So if the model is hindsight, insight, foresight. There's another little tiny bit of sight with it, and that's oversight. So don't forget to learn from the mistakes, and don't forget to take a systems approach, because it's what everything that happens together that really, really matters. So that's what I'm going to be doing. What are you going to be doing? Um, and now we've got Hayden Blackley. Hi, I'm a Head of Learning and Teaching at the University of Glamorgan in South Wales. And like Julie, looking forward to the future is something that thrills me with genuine excitement. Having spent the last five years of my life working in technology enhanced learning before taking a wider remit, I'm one of those who knows that enhancement of learning and teaching in the next decade isn't going to happen unless it's going to happen through technology. This isn't something where learning technologists are now, do we have them at the universities? Do we have people in schools who are learning technologists as well as teachers? Do we have people in the FE sector who use technology? It's the only way I'm going to suggest that we can survive. And I'll tell you why I think this. It's because I remember how I first learned to swim. And with a sea metaphor, I know when I've been out on the Gower that it looks so beautiful when the sun is shining. But just get a little bit away and you get that lovely pull of the Bristol Channel making the water go from north to south. Oh yeah, and here's the Atlantic making sure you're going west to east. So if you're not familiar with the currents, don't go on the boat because you'll end up three beaches over and think, where the am I? And I remember learning to swim because I'd gone for lots of training in a local pool. I failed. Every time they took those things off that they held me up, and I had less buoyancy in those days, I have to say, than I currently do, I would sink. It was just a consistent factor until I went sailing. And I fell off the end of the boat. And suddenly I found that somewhere there was all this ability to do something that I'd proven I couldn't do in the past. I was now able to swim at least as far enough until I got some sand under my feet and could st stand up. And I think these next few years are going to feel a bit like that for those of us who are doing learning technology and looking at how technology enhances learning and are looking at learning and teaching. Why? Because when I have conversations with our vice chancellor, we're saying, how are we going to model in Wales a 40% reduction in income over the next four years? England might get away, I reckon, with 30 to 32%. But of course, in Wales, HE is nowhere near a significant a political item. And pre and post school is, is where the politicians get their votes from. So we're going to have even bigger cuts, I suspect. And my vice chancellor is saying to me, how are we going to do those things? And of course, what happens then is everybody gets into, apologies to any accountants, accountant's mind. Everybody gets to say, oh yeah, how can we cut that little bit out? What can we stop doing? But as Julie says, it's not the time to worry about keeping those waves back. Good old Canute managed to prove it couldn't happen way back. So why do we try doing that? What do we do that makes that difference happen? What do we do that allows us to change and for me, that big thing is to remember what we thought we already knew. That learning technology is not about technology and is about the learning. And even universities are not about 
worrying about our financial situation, but about the learners. And so those of you who've heard me presenting in the symposium on the student learning in the digital age project and other projects that are going on, the work of Rona Sharp and Helen Beetham, will know that I believe and hope I share that belief with you that if we're going to be here making that difference, we don't look to see what those cuts are, but to see how if we're going to have learners who are not going to just be good at using technology in the university or school, which is sometimes where we get a little bit monofocal, but are actually going to be using that technology for life, then guys and girls, they need us. The world needs us, and sometimes we forget that. It's, this is my fourth Alt-C, and, and the first one was three years ago here, and at that time we were all talking to each other about, oh, what's a learning technologist? Oh, do we have a profession? Thank God those conversations are beyond us. Now we're asking, how do we ensure that learner voice influences learners who become the people who challenge society? And how could we possibly let them down if we focused on our budgets and not on what makes a difference for them? Thank you, Hayden. So. <laughs> Somehow I've got a feeling I know what it was like to listen to an Iron Bevin from that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've, we've, we've now got... Um, three Johns, which the middle John told me is, was the name of a band, but um, he, he might know. Um, and the first of the Johns is, uh, is John Clayton. Uh, thank you. I don't know if I'll be playing music, though. I'll leave that singing to John. I can't play an instrument. Um, I'm John Clayton. I'm from the Emerging Technology Centre in Hamilton, New Zealand. And that's where the good beaches will be, Jilly. If you're, uh, <laughs> Australia doesn't have much at all. But uh, <laughs> they're close enough to us to call us nuggets, so we'll <laughs> leave that here. I hope there's no Australian. How many Australians are here? Oh, unfortunate that you live there. You gave a thinking of coming to New Zealand? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, when I got the question, and I'm not, I, I, I just thought what... I, I, I just thought, well, what... what um, what shall I talk about? What am I going to do when I get back to, back to Wintech next Monday? And I, what, what sort of tasks am I going to be undertaking? And the first thing that came to mind is we've, um, in the past in our institution, we've provided professional development to staff on a wholesale centralised provision. So we said all staff need this professional development. Put them in a technology lab and teach them how to use this technology and then get them to go away and we're hoping that this will make a change to them and that they'll start using it. But what we've been doing recently as a part of our studies that we did, we looked at that model and as I did a presentation here and we called that the deficit model. We're actually looking at people and we're saying, well, you really need some training because you're not really good enough to teach and you need to be done this and then what we do is we structure this and we go in and we cure these people of their lack of technology ability. And so what, we, what we've been working on is actually saying, well, really, that's not what we want. We want tutors to come to us and actually say, I want this professional development and this, this type of technique because I'm going to be using whiteboards, I'm going to be using lecture capture technologies, I'm going to be using Moodle. I want to be able to do this. And that, then we want to do... Um, provide that professional development. And what we've developed is an assessment rubric. And on this assessment rubric, we're allowing people to go into it and look at some learning outcomes, and then underneath it will be some generalised questions for them. And what they'll do is they'll select these questions and they'll either be competent, confident or capable in that, or they won't be. And what they'll get is a little carpet if you've seen the EMM model from New Zealand, Stephen Marshall's work, what you do is with a self-review framework is you create a carpet, and the carpet will have all these colours. The darker the colour means you're really competent and confident in that subject. The lighter the colour, you, need, you can identify that you need to do some training. So when we go back to New Zealand, we're going to start rolling out that assessment rubric. And because we can roll that out, we've created a certificate in open, flexible and networked learning, which we're just going to get, try and get approved. 
And what it does for us is it allows people to review where they are, it allows them to uh, undertake the professional development that they want, and it gives them the power and the motivation to undertake all that training. So that's where we're, the, the immediate thing when we go back is to look at an assessment rubric type model where people can actually be empowered to choose the professional development in learning technologies that they want, rather than us saying, come along at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon to learn how to do Moodle learn how to do Moodle quizzes, learn how to do this. We're actually saying that's not the model that, that really motivates you. Let's do something different. Let's try and get this working like that. Thank you. Thank you. And now, John Cook. So, um, yeah, the three, the three Johns, uh, I, uh, Feel free to use the John. Uh, you know, I've checked my flies, uh, Donna, actually. And uh, so uh, it's uh, difficult to follow some of these guys. Uh, but uh, I'm John Cook. I'm a, a professor from, of learning, technology enhanced learning from the Learning Technology Research Institute based at uh, London Met University, uh, which has been in the news quite a lot for various reasons. And, but it's a good university to work at. And we're, uh, we've been hiding away in a little unit uh, with my colleagues, Andrew and Tom. I don't know if they're here. But uh, now being moved back into education, the department, uh, uh, to do some, you know, some proper work, some teaching again, which I'm really looking forward to, uh, rather than uh, waltzing around doing research projects. So we'll do a bit of both. So it's, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's good to have a, 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 a proper day job again, actually. And so this, this question com is quite pertinent for me. Um, what the story I often tell is about technology. It's about automatic teller machines and, um, you know, ATMs. I love the idea of going to the wall and getting money out. But what happened before they put them in the wall is they, when they were first invented, this piece of tech, was uh, they put them inside the banks. They, uh, so you couldn't get your money out in an evening, you couldn't get it out at the weekends. But if someone had the brainwave, the paradigm shift, to go take this piece of technology, put it in the wall, and it was more useful for people. So this, this is, what, one of my jobs uh, is to go, will be to show my colleagues, and I did use work for the Deputy Vice-Chancellor trying to do this, you go around sh showing colleagues the use of technology, how you can use it, and frankly, we're to I'm talking to a converted audience here, but I'm sure you have this in your, your institutions, it's colleagues, that are the, the teaching colleagues do sometimes, uh, they need a bit of a nudge, uh, the paradigm shift thing, which is, it comes from Kuhn used the, the thing, we need a shift in the way you think about things, we need to take the technology outside the, the wall, put it in things, and hence my interest in, in mobile learning. Uh, and I think you've got the students have got this technology, and um, you, they're, they're very au fait with it. And I was quite interested to um, to see the talk by um, uh, Alex Bowles earlier on from the Students Union, and he, he mentioned a tweet uh, from students, and he says we need to create added value, not not uh, you know not not. May have value from the technology. It's quite interesting what the students think, and they think the, the staff are good with PowerPoint, but then you know they're not very good with other uh, technology. But hey, that doesn't matter. We can help them, and so there's, there's, it's nice to know that the students will help us. So the whole thing about what the technology is not about the technology; it's about the pedagogy, and it's putting the students first, which has been mentioned by my colleague, is quite important. Remembering, I think uh, we should get Alex to maybe do a keynote again, or uh, people from the students' union. It's usually very, it's very important to keep getting this perspective, and I find that's a good argument, which I'm going to win in my role of, of working in uh, the Faculty of Humanities arts, languages and education. I'll be working with colleagues and, and I'll be reminding them of the student perspective. And it's not in its, uh, uh, I, see, I saw some tweets going on about, um, they don't, students, you know, you can't always use these fancy technologies because sometimes you want to promote certain times of learning and it's difficult. Uh, that's true, but uh, um, th that was James, uh, James Clay's uh, tweet. Uh, but I think um, it's, it's our, our job to enthuse them and I think, um, um, one, one thing I find useful is uh, I've, I used to, um, my middle name's Nigel, and um, I've got, I use in, in SlideShare and, and Skype things, uh, John Nigel Cook, because it makes me unique. Then someone, people who know me, uh, I used to play in pop bands, and I used to have a black quiff out here, and someone said, no, it's John, I thought it was Johnny Jell Cook, you know, so it's like, it's, it's good to, to reinvent, well, reinvent yourself uh, and um, be, you know, uh, have different personas, even if it's the same persona. And I'll be doing that with colleagues, trying to think of ways to do the paradigm shift. And uh, what, this, is, this is nice. These things are popping off. It's, 
what's going on there, Julie? Yeah. Was that you? Did you press the button? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think the, the, the gel. You've got, to, you've got to make things gel. And uh, the paradigm shift is <laughs> you've got... You've, you, you, I won't be giving people... And the, 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 the thing about the ATMs is how far do you take that, that, that metaphor? You're taking money out of the wall. Are we taking money out of the students? You know, so I'm a bit worried about where I'm going with that particular sea change. But uh, maybe that vice chancellor's probably quite like that. But, so it, it is about putting the students at the centre of the, the, my colleagues' thoughts. That's the way I've always managed to win arguments. And, and yeah, that's the way I think the ideas will gel. So thank you. <laughs> Put this back on. John. And the third and final John is John, John McLaughlin. Well, if we have a band of the three Johns with the name John McLaughlin, I've got to be the guitarist, I guess. But um, my ability to play the guitar is roughly akin to my in-depth knowledge of higher further education, teaching and technology. I'm uh, a civil servant. I work for the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills. My policy responsibility is for um, government policy and the use of IT in further and higher education. Um, but I come to that with a complete lack of knowledge about these, these issues. I don't have the decades of experience, or even in Julie's case, the thousand years of experience and knowledge uh, to bring to you. Um, I do, however, on, on reflection on my own learning career when I was young, uh, I, I, I had a quite dramatic effect on my own learning with a piece of technology, because when I started school, we used to write with uh, nibs that stuck in bits of wood, and you dipped into ink wells with ink. And I was bloody awful at that. But when they invented biros, a wonderful piece of technology, I could suddenly write. And that suddenly opened up my own uh, learning and, and led me, sadly perhaps, to where I am today. So to get back to the exam question, I've got to make a couple of points first of all. One is that uh, I did need, in order to answer this, make the assumption that anything uh, I did could have that kind of significant impact. And therefore, I've, I've viewed this as if I actually do have uh, an influential position in government or that maybe an influential government minister had actually instructed me uh, to concentrate on this area of work. Uh, and secondly, I've, I've avoided the populist answer that the activity I, I would concentrate on would be to prevent any funding cuts for education. It might have got a, a cheer, but it wouldn't have led to any debate and discussion. From the perspective of the government, it would be completely unrealistic. And anyway, I think I already spend a lot of my time helping to support the case that Biz is putting forward to the Treasury for sustaining uh, the approach to expenditure in, in further and higher education. So I think I'm already doing some of that. No, I take the view that if I had a blank, if all of us had a blank sheet of paper on which to design a post-18-19 or maybe post-16 education and training system that met the needs of our economy uh, going into the 21st century, it would look very different from the one uh, that we actually have. Um, and I wouldn't mind betting that with this very different system we could get higher numbers of graduates, trainees, trained professionals and specialists than we have now. We would have them better educated and better trained than now. It would also have more better focused research. It would be more readily and more freely available. And not only that, uh, we could do all of this with the same money that we now spend or maybe even with less money than we now spend if we were able to design a brand new system from scratch based on what we now know, based on the thousand years or more that Julie and others have talked about and based on the use of technology. Uh, but we're not in that situation. I believe the design of our present system largely results from the, uh, the position of the traditional university degree in uh, the, 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 the organisation of our system. It's based on a, uh, the idea of a relatively small group of people going to university at 18, 19 or 20, studying full time for eight, nine months a year for three years. Their studies comprise one or two lectures of one hour each week uh, in a number of, of topics which are closely related. Their support, that's supported by classes, tutorials, lab work each week, and then assessed by written exams at the end of the process. And then they go out to work and earn their... Uh, and, and uh, pursue their career. And, and the, all that teaching that they have will be delivered by academics whose principal purpose is actually conduct and public re publish research. 
So I think that, that, that premise, conscious or unconscious, seems to me to be the sun around which all of the other elements of our FE and HE system have to circulate and are influenced by. And I think that's a, a fundamental problem. So if I had the chance, the exam question, to concentrate on one single activity, I'd spend my time trying to move towards a system and approach that you might design if you had that blank sheet of paper. More realistically, that means trying to develop a more level playing field for our system, making relationships between one part and another more logical, providing greater parity and sense in funding systems, removing barriers that inhibit flexible approaches or that prevent teachers from doing things differently or more innovatively. Uh, and, and a lot of you find that, I'm, I'm sure, in, in your professional lives. So what would be my key targets for this uh, initiative? Well, I think the, the key one would be the position of part-time studies or other forms of non-full-time, non-continuous studies. There should be a funded system that, that means that they're treated comparably to the traditional full-time study. And there is a, still a place for, for the traditional approach, I think, but it, it has a place, not uh, that position of the sun. This more flexible approach would allow students to choose a studying approach that suited them and suited their circumstances and that could change if their circumstances changed. Uh, and, and institutions would be able to offer uh, a more varied and more flexible pattern of studies to meet these varying needs. And also ensure that our funding was, was looking at chunks or modules rather than whole courses, um, funding learning results rather than just the inputs. Um, another bugbear of mine is and, and therefore a, a target for maybe would be for the first year undergraduate courses. I, I think this country wastes um, a, a, a lot of money uh, and resources on designing learning resources independently and separately throughout the country for essentially the same courses. Let's have a common set of resources for uh, the, the, the broad range of of first year undergraduate studies in economics, physics, French, etc., the common courses and, and a similar approach in FE, so that what different institutions do, what different teachers do, is concentrate their valuable expertise on how they use the resources to teach, not on designing uh, resources that, that are essentially pretty similar. And I think HE and FE are false distinctions and, and cause problems in our system. It's much more, I believe, of a continuum um, through, I don't even work, know where you start or where you end, but it, it, it's not that distinction that, that, that we always seem to look for, certainly in, in government between the two, uh, and therefore look for funding of, of all of our higher and further education as we now see it on a more equal and a more consistent basis, that would help bring far greater logic to the academic and vocational question uh, that, that, that we still face. We shouldn't have to say, is it academic or vocational? Again, that's part of, of that continuum. And might it be better for, for most, if not all of us, um, to be expected to study for tra or, or, or to train up until around age around 20, not, not thinking of 20, you know, three years up to 21, 22, but... but um, a couple of years post-18, and then move into, and that might be full or part-time even then, and certainly at age 20, you, you go out into, into work and practical experience with an employer uh, or as an independent learner, uh, maybe, um, and then come back after a few years of practice to finish off uh, your studies or, or to further your studies, perhaps to uh, bachelor's level or, or further, actually. The, the master's level seems far more relevant to... Um, most professional careers these days, um, and therefore the, the idea of, a, of, of the, the, the bachelor's level is, is becoming uh, just a stepping stone. Um, but again, master's level studies um, are not properly funded or not equ equally funded within our system, so that's another fault. So what I would like to do to foster the, the sea change uh, and maybe the, the, the metaphor of, of the sea change uh, for me is about the storms that will follow uh, the 20th of October when the funding review uh, is reported. But, but what I'd like to do um, to foster that sea change is to promote and encourage a, a comprehensive culture change in uh, our education system. And that means that, that we'll, we'll be in a situation where technology uh, can encourage and lubricate this change. And the change itself would then enable uh, far greater, more sensible use of technology that will fully support and enhance the whole teaching and learning process, uh, not just for a few years from 16 or 18, but 
uh, over a whole life of learning, which is what we need in uh, the, the modern society that we're living in. Thanks a lot. Um, and our final input is from Julie Vos. I must say it's quite a hard act to follow five very distinguished people. I, I'm not quite distinguished, more easy to distinguish as perhaps the only redhead at the conference. Um, Hayden focused on the world needs us. Well, I'm going to come down to a very local level and talk about how Imperial College, where I'm from, um, needs me. I, I'm the, or not necessarily me, but me and, and our learning technologists. Um, I'm the e-learning services manager and I'm based in the ICT department at Imperial College. Um, the key thing that's affecting us at the moment is a VLE review. Now, there might be groans amongst the audience from people who have done one, are doing one, or are thinking of doing one. It, it's a big thing, and it, and it will foster a change within the, an institution. For us, we're seeing, you know, maybe it's a potential for, for more developed use of the VLE. Like many people, we have some very good areas of use of the VLE, and then some who don't really use it or, or just put up a couple of resources. So maybe this will foster a change from the supplemental use to a more dependent use of the VLE. The, the interest that we've found so far throughout our uh, review is, is looking at more collaboration through blogs, wikis, workspaces, um, and bringing people together more. W what we found is that they don't really want um, the VLE to do everything, but they do want access to more tools. So trying to bring everything into the VLE um, through seamless integration and enabling people to do more. The key thing is probably going to be about changing the ways of working. People want to be more efficient. So things like inline notifications. So you're, you're browsing your, your learning materials. You don't want to have to click away, go and find the forum. You want the forum messages appearing, a bit like following a, a, a Twitter feed. Personalization is key. They, they want to be able to log in, see what they want, when they want it, um, and not necessarily have to go right, have to go into this course and then find that bit. Increased connectivity with the use of mobile devices. Mobiles are becoming quite a buzzword at Imperial, and people are looking at, at how they can incorporate them. But it shouldn't just be a case of, of accessing the VLE through the mobile, through a web browser, but really making use of mobiles and, and, and the uh, things they can provide. The challenges that are going to face us um, are to do with budgets. So we're facing either reduced or zero increased budgets, and we also have a recruitment freeze on support posts. So how is this going to affect us when we're trying to bring in a, a new system and, and change things? Um, we are going to have to justify the effectiveness of the VLE. We could go through the review and at the end of it we find, well, actually, there isn't much funding, so what do we do now? We've chosen this VLE, but we can't afford it. Hopefully that won't be an issue, but it, it might be, and it's things that we're, we're probably all going to have to face up to, is even if we, we do integrate with other tools, can we afford to bring those tools in? And the key thing is, is ensuring the buy-in from senior management. So through our jobs, we're going to have to ensure that um, we, we do prove to them that what we're doing is effective and it's having results. And for the, the, our users, it's about managing the expectations. Um, we're not going to find the perfect VLE, although some vendors will tell you that they have it. Um, we're going to have to compromise, and it's something we're gonna, you know, we'll have to make people realise. So probably a, a shorter talk on a slightly different slant from everyone else, but... Thank you. That's great. Thanks for being here. Okay. Um, I'll just give you a quick recap before the votes come in. No, that's that's not serious. It's it's not the X factor, but there's I mean there's certainly been some really interesting themes. I mean I, I love the insight, hindsight, foresight, but also oversight from Gillian. I think that was the main message. We've got to see it see it as a piece, see it as a system, but also see it historically and, and understand that to really take the change forward, which was brilliant. Hayden, very much learning at the centre, but also the learner, which is a, a key theme, learning and the learner. Um, John, actually, let's ditch the old models of professional development. Let's talk about self-review um, and um, assessment tools, and, or, or tools to, to support that, that self-reflection and, 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 and assessment for practitioners. Um, John, that's sort of the paradigm shift and the making technology useful but again the key message around the students are at the center of this and making it useful to them um, is, 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 is important. Um, John from a very much a policy perspective uh, it would be great to um, start from scratch and to design from a blank sheet of paper 
Um, but what we really want to do, we need to do is to put the, uh, well, generally funding incentives in to make, and other, possibly other policy incentives, but funding incentives in to um, incentivise uh, learning in different ways and, and, and designing learning and delivering um, programmes in, in, in different ways. So that's a redesign kind of a, approach. And then um, from a kind of an institutional approach, again, it's that issue of making the technology useful. So using opportunities like the redesign of a VLE to um, meet the needs of learners in, t in terms of what they want to do. Again, a kind of a learner perspective, not necessarily learner voice, but learner perspective in that to get the right functionality to make that change um, uh, from a kind of a supplementary use to a more dependent use on the, on the core technologies. So I think that's where we are. We've got an opportunity now um, for questions, <coughs> comments, um, observations from the floor, and we're also getting them in from the, um, the Twitter feed and, and Illuminate. So um, anyone for a stab at a question or observation or a view? Hi, it's uh, Mark Johnson from the University of Bolton. Um, it seems that it, this is more of a comment than a question, perhaps. Um, I want to make an appeal for recognizing how important the technological decisions that we're taking now, recognizing the consequences of those decisions on the, the generation to come. And it, it seems to me that we need a, a sort of moral seriousness about our consideration of technology, which um, perhaps has been lacking in the past. We haven't taken technology seriously, perhaps in the way that Jilly's hinting at, this, this sort of very deep ecological, historical perspectives. And I, I just wonder what the panel then sees as the key moral choices that we're faced with as we look at learning technology now. I'm just going to get this microphone because uh, I think to respond to that it may well be useful. Um, is anyone from the panel want to answer that? Oh, John first. John, you you get three. I think that's right. I mean, we, I was in the, um, the, the ethics um, symposium and the, the things, uh, I'm, I'll just make this, the point I make there very quickly, is that when we're, when we're looking at these things, it, we shouldn't just tag on ethics uh, through the committees and, and things like that, or just it should be part of the debate all the time. With the mobiles in particular, you're getting the notion where things can be tracked, your, your location can be tracked, your context, what you're doing can be uh, observed, and it's, this is, and, and then should, but should that be, uh, you've got in different cultures, they want Blackberries to un, un um, you know, unpick their security codes, and so you're getting this, all, this whole debate's coming to the fore, and, and, pe and decisions we in ed education piggyback off typically uh, what's going on in commerce, or Flash, and the, the certain the mobile service providers, and yet a lot of these, what we can't scale up and get efficiencies unless these different, we, we as uh, education, uh, you know, uh, schools, FE, HE, band together to get to get the uh, the economies of scale. But there's lots of moral issues in, involved in there. But you know, we're, we're, we need to do it. We've got chest in higher education. We get cheaper software, but we can't do the same and meet the needs that were mentioned. Uh, you know, to, to use the mobiles. So I think there needs to be a bit of a, a bit of a push and a banding together again, a unified strategy. I think, Mark, I welcome particularly the, the look at ethics, and because I have a background uh, in uh, model philosophy, it's something that's very familiar to me. However, I've heard it used as an excuse not to do anything. I don't think you're using it in that context, because I, I, I know the kind of stuff that you're writing and thinking about, but I'd be very wary of raising it too high up the flag if it becomes an option to, oh yeah, we can't engage in using something that's going to help the learners learn or because we haven't yet understood the moral dimension. So I just like it not to become another t dictator like some of the other very well-meaning but, but and engaging activities that can actually stop allowing us doing things which effectively help learners. Yeah, we need to think about it. Yes, we need to make sure that all the other people who are, are assisting learners in their learning journey are able to consider what it means. But we don't want to wait till we've got a model philosophy of technology, well, in fact, I suggest we possibly already have one, but of new technologies before we actually go and do something. Okay, thank you. I've got um, a very good question coming in, uh, came in through Twitter, really, um, earlier on. Um, is too much weight given to the student, avoid, student voice? Do learners know best? <laughs> Julie. 
<laughs> yeah, it's a really interesting question, isn't it? I, I don't think they do. Um, I mean, one of the things we've been trying to do is to engage with the learner as an equal partner and imagine in the future. And I can tell you, if you have focus groups and all this sort of stuff, you don't really get anything usable. Um, and in the end, you know, when one learner said to me, you're the professor, you're supposed to know this kind of stuff, I realised that the approach really wasn't working. But we have now developed a whole series of um, workshops to help them um, imagine in the future in new kinds of ways um, uh, based on the, the, this the insight foresight oversight model that I briefly described earlier. And using the technologies themselves, using, we've invented something called Googleopoly and all this sort of thing, fun type things. And we are now starting to get some uh, um, real workable scenarios and some real um, baseline ideas that, that we can work with. So I, I don't think they know, how can they know? It's the same challenges that we have and to look into the future. But I think there are ways, and it, it's all on the project, and I'm happy to share with anyone who's interested um, how you can actually go about enabling learners to offer you preferred scenarios for the future which are useful. So it's not that they don't know best. It's that you need to find the right ways of yeah. getting that. that um, the evidence in the Glamorgan context is that engaging student voice and supporting them to be able to articulate the decision has improved the way that they engage with technology and learning. I grant I've never taught anybody that's under the age of 18 and most of our students are over the age of 30 given the nature of our institution. So there may be elements of learning and teaching where it wouldn't be uh, applying as directly. But the idea that our learners, because I'm one of them, remember, because I'm still learning, aren't able to engage, we can facilitate that engagement but actually, because it's not just about what they're going to do for the next three years, but because it's about what they're going to do with the rest of their lives, uh, and very definitely in the hortology end of, of models of learning in that context. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's look for some more questions in the audience. I think there were one or two hands up. We've got um, two, at the, two at the front. Okay, we've got one hand up that I didn't notice, first of all, <laughs> and then two down at the front row here. Right, as, as I've got the mic, a quick sheet, a comment on the last one, which is, our users, as learning technologists, don't always know best, we know that, so why should students always know best? Mm. But I actually wanted to say something completely different, which is, it seems to me that if we really want to be radical about these things, we need to separate summative assessment from teaching. Why can't I go to a university and say, hey, I'm a really good learning technologist, I can demonstrate it, I can get a degree. We've still got attendance-based learning. You have to come and do a year or three years or whatever it is to gain the qualification. You have to pay the fees to do the studying, whether or not you know it. And actually, if we want to support real better learning, maybe we need to separate the two, allow students to use the technology, use people, use whatever they want to learn, um, so I'd like your comments on that, particularly those from institutions who might be most impacted by that. Yeah, um, I, I quite agree with, with that. Why, why? And the, one of the things about assessment rubrics that we're, we're, lo we're looking at pushing out is we're starting to say, well, yes, divo divorce the summative assessment totally from the actual requirements that they need. So if you can prove, we've got a certificate, we've... we've outline it, it's got elements, it's got objectives, learning outcomes, and people go through the certificate and they choose what they want to do. But it also is an opportunity for them to demonstrate their capabilities. So at one time they'll, they'll say, oh, I, I want an assessment on uh, outcome one. So they'll go and provide some evidence or undertake some training or undertake some professional development or do something and then provide that evidence against that summative assessment and then be able to complete the certificate. So what it does is it, it opens entry at any time, at any place, for them to do what they want, not in a structured a way, oh, you've got to turn up on Tuesday at 10 o'clock to do the Moodle part. No, you can choose to, you can choose to be assessed on the Moodle ac activity at any time, and you just provide the evidence that you've done it. And if you can't uh, do that, and you need some help, you go to the professional development unit and you are mentored to uh, uh, get you to complete that competency or that you need to complete, provide the evidence. So that means assessment is flexible. 
So you've got open entry, you've got open assessment. That's the way, that's the way of the world. Okay, thanks. So there's some models already developing around that. I think the answer is yes to the, <laughs> to the question. Uh, I think we've got Nigel down at the front first. Okay, thanks, Vanessa. This is really directed both at Jilly and, and John McLaughlin. I've been interested at this conference in, in the sense that national policies seem to sort of float over us and be seen as being inevitable. And at, at another level, we have institutional policies that people say are the barriers to, to change and development. Using Jilly's metaphor around harnessing sort of historical knowledge, insight, foresight, oversight, and so on. How at an institutional level can we generate the feedback loops into policy to change it and move it forward? And for John, from the institutions, how would he see the institutions as influencing the policy climate ra rather than just being passive receptors of the decisions made without evidence by governments of all colours rather than just the present one? Well, as I've got the microphone, I suppose I'd better answer first. Um, I th sitting from the, the perspective of government, um, we certainly don't see institutions as passive recipients of whatever government policy uh, might come along. They are very vocal um, participants in the process and um, many universities in particular, but also FE colleges and other learning providers have great influence within um, government in its broadest sense as well as specific politi politi political parties. Therefore there is a great influence and, and um, government decisions aren't, although they might seem they are at times, they aren't taken in isolation. They're taken, taking into account the reactions that there will be based upon um, a knowledge of, of those systems. So I, you know, we have a very complex um, political and social and economic environment and, and government does its best within uh, the principles that each government sets to make logical decisions based on um, the evidence that they believe they have. Now, Sometimes the evidence um, is the evidence that they find supports their arguments and they can ignore uh, the evidence that doesn't support their arguments. Um, but I think in general they do try to make logical decisions based upon a coherent um, political and economic approach. The results we might not agree with or we might agree with and the results are affected by um, you know, a whole wide range of uh, different um, um, uh, strands and environments in the world, in the economy. And if, if we come back and focus on, let's say, higher education, government can, government funds and funds certain things, but only what, you know, not much more than 50% of higher education these days. And it doesn't specifically direct <coughs> universities as institutions to do things, it tries to influence them and lead them in certain ways. Um, and then within the institution, um, it, it generally institutions don't specifically direct academics. Um, again, it's, a, it's a, 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 a complex picture of checks and balances within an institution. So if you come from, let's say, from David Cameron down to the student, there are a whole range of different processes and decisions within there which probably pull in a range of different directions and then the world economy and, and, and environment impacts as well, which is why it is not a simple matter and why my approach was very simplistic earlier because even if I had the opportunity to do that and the power to influence, um, it would not go simply in that kind of direction because our world is very, very complex. Thanks, John. Julie, do you have, you, you were mentioned, so do you have anything? Yeah, I have a go. Um, I, th I think the thing is, is it's about to dig in the channels on the beach. You know, 
No, it's very easy to stand by and say, whoa, what was that that went by that's, you know, sort of changed our lives? But I really don't think that any of us need to do that, you know. I mean, <clears throat> I certainly didn't grow up with any privilege. I, I've not been full-time to university. I've only done it by taking whatever opportunities and working with them as they're presented. And, for example, when I went to Leicester, there certainly wasn't an already structured process to get involved in consultation. But I do understand that if you can strategize, especially a strategy that you don't then create from afar and try and impose on everyone else, but it, you treat as a process, a process to be worked with, then everyone can be involved in that. I do believe that everyone can get involved at the institutional level. And at the government level, um, for example, ALT is involved in itself, you know, in consultations. So is the Higher Education Academy. They're not kind of there to impose things on us. It's entirely possible to get involved in these things. You only have to ask, you'd be welcomed to do that. So it's actually, you know, at all sorts of levels that any, anyone in this room, anyone listening, you know, would be welcome to get involved in that. And the key thing you need to understand is if you can get a strategy accepted, resources will flow. You know, it's the strategy that creates the resource to do something. You know, it's not a separate process. Um, and that does happen in institutions. You may say, oh, it won't happen in mine, but I tell you it does. If you can get something accepted as a university strategy, no matter how small, then there is some commitment to making sure that that activity is realised. Hope that's of Strate some help. Strategising properly is the yeah. is the answer <laughs> at, at different levels. I think we did have one hand up over there. Yeah. Yeah, James Clay, Gloucestershire College. Julie gave a, um, told us in her thing that the VLE is not dead, and that um, it can be part of a well-rounded PLE. Yesterday, Dave White gave a very passionate defence about how, explaining how the lecture is not dead. And that, but you know, the question that I think we do need to ask, are we clinging to what we're comfortable with, with what we're used to doing and what we've been used to doing for ages? Or do we need to stop, rethink and change what we do? We've got to stop doing what we've always done because we've always done it that way. Term starts in September. We know why, because the students need to get the harvest in. I'm going to ask Julie to answer that, actually, so we'll pass the microphone along. I'll try to answer it, but, um, I mean, at Imperial, we are looking at a VLE, whether that's the best thing we should do. I mean, we have said maybe we, we ditch a VLE and, and go with the best of breed approach, you know, and bring in all the, the other tools that people do want to use, rather than sort of clinging onto a VLE and doing everything through that. But the VLE was, is what people are used to, and maybe it is just a case of going with, with what we're currently doing. And maybe we do need to sit back and, and think about how, how we might change things. Um, I was speaking to someone who was thinking, well, maybe we, we sort of phase out the VLE slowly, but bring in the other tools that people are really wanting to use. Anyone else like to comment on that? I guess I'm going to agree with James in, in, in many of what he said. Uh, like Jilly, my educational experience was entirely through a distance learning, so I've never uh, attended a lecture in my life until I gave my first one. And it's interesting to me that, uh, therefore, I didn't fall into some of the traps that some of my colleagues talk about. This is how it happened to me, and therefore, it, it didn't happen um, again. And I think that's one of the challenges for the whole area of learning technology, is there are things which work simply because we've got this space. And this discussion, we're sitting with eight of us up here and a whole pile of you there because the space says that. And while we can strategize about how we'd want the space to be in 20 years, I know that if I went back to um, our Department of Children, Education, Lifelong Learning and Skills, who do listen, as John was indicating, they'd end up saying, what about all the wasted space? because we'd have lovely, flexible alternatives. And as an institution, we'd be arguing that there are efficiencies around economy of scale. And we'd be saying, actually, though, we don't care if not much of the learning happens there. What is the scaffolding that's around it? And I think for us, 
It's discovering that scaffolding. And from a learner voice point of view, people are still coming to university. We're trying to discover why they're doing that. We're trying to do a lot of research on why aren't they all now open university students? Because, you know, if I was going to be there as an advocate of a way to learn which suited my own learning styles and experience, absolutely perfectly. But that's not where we are. And as long as we have people who are going to turn up, they're going to have some expectations that I think it's going to take quite a long time for us to challenge. Okay, I'm going to draw it to a close, actually, because we're, we've run out of time. I think we, this debate will run and run. Um, we're going now to closing remarks, and we'll do a bit of, so apologies for a bit of stage shuffling when we'll kind of move around a little bit. Can we thank all of our six panellists for their contributions and all of you for your discussion? Thank you.